2021 is coming to a close, and I'm still getting lots and lots of lighting questions. So let's chill for a little bit tonight. Let's try and answer some questions, wrap things up, and get you ready for 2022. Stay tuned. Hey gang, I am Joe Edelman and welcome to another live episode of The Last Frame. Thank you so much for joining me on this Wednesday evening. You know the drill. Leave me a little comment in the chat. Let me know that you're here and where you're watching from. And if you're watching the replay, no sweat. Leave a comment below the video. Let me know that you checked in to check it out. It's always cool to see where people are tuning in from. Right now already, I've got, uh, let's see here, we've got uh, Charles who's out in California. I've got Robert in New Jersey, Enzo in New York. Uh, where are we? I've got Olas in uh, Netherlands, Robert also in New Jersey, Danny in Vegas, Lynn in New York. Great to see you all. Thank you very much. You're all part of a growing global community of photographers in over 100 countries who tune in to watch The Last Frame every week. Even Kim from Copenhagen and Kieran from Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you all. So listen, lighting. You know, I, I, I don't mean to sound frustrated that I'm still getting questions about lighting because I will forever get questions about lighting. Questions about lighting will forever be a part of photography. But indeed, there are some questions that come up over and over and over and over again. And I think that, honestly, you can never talk about them too much because we are in a time period where lighting is changing dramatically. It's evolving just incredibly fast. And the thing that doesn't get talked about enough when it comes to lighting is our cameras. Our cameras have been evolving and photographers, we have not been paying attention. We have not been keeping up. Most of us are not using our cameras to their full potential and definitely not using them the way they're actually intended to be used when it comes to the way we choose to do lighting. So I will start out and I'm really serious, guys. I'm here for you tonight. So what, what are the things that you're struggling with? Type me some messages. I have a question that's left over from last week. And so as long as everybody stops trying to help Charles in the chat here, I'm going to deal with Charles and give my input. And then Charles is intelligent enough. He can go out and he can go and do what he feels will be, be useful. So last week, Charles asked me, and Charles, I'm sorry, but I just ran out of time last week. Okay. So uh, I've got the chat back up from last week so that I can read the question pieces here. You raised the question about using gels, but not how to use them, when to use them. The question was, how can you make them convenient? Specifically, Charles wanted to say he dreads using scissors and rubber bands and tape to attach them. Um, and because of that inconvenience and kind of the artsy craftsy aspect of having to attach the gels, he says he rarely uses them. So he's just trying to find what options may be available. He's aware of MagMod, which the basic MagMods are too small. He is trying out the MagMod 42, which accepts those hard disk gels, uh, the round ones that you can drop in, which by the way, all the MagMod gels are hard. Even the small ones are, are hard. Um, and um, he's working in a small studio space. It's a converted garage. So he's not throwing light, you know, long distance or any of that kind of stuff. He likes to do a lot of low key stuff. Um, he doesn't really want to have to kind of change his looks, you know, to his images. He just really wants to be able to add colors in. So, um, and I just want to make sure here, I had asked him, let's see, he's using AC powered studio strobes, Godox mount. Um, and I know there was a little bit more information, Charles, but that's all that's coming up for me right now. So here's the thing. Um, the challenge that you're going to have with a lot of lighting, Charles, is that some companies make some super convenient modifier setups. Other cameras or other companies, not so much. And even the companies that do make convenient setups, depending on what kind of modifier you're putting on your light and what kind of bulb the light is, meaning is it bare bulb, is it Fresnel lens, you know, that type of stuff. 
it's impossible to find a one size fits all solution. You just can't. Um, certainly when I was shooting with Godox 8200s, which I still have, I haven't got rid of them, but you know, I'm shooting mostly LED now, but when I had the Godox 8200s, I loved the basic mag mods because they were a perfect fit. Uh, I have Godox 8400s in my studio that I will frequently use as background lights and mounted on those Godox 8400s, I have seven inch reflectors. And on the seven inch reflectors, I have a set of barn door slash filter holders where I can drop in seven inch uh, pre-cut gels. Those gels could be mounted gels that you mount in a cardboard frame or you can buy them in a metal frame, or it could just be a gel sheet and it's gonna stay in that holder. So if the brand light that you're using, in this case, the Godox, and the modifier that you're using don't have a simple way to drop them in, I'll tell you how I used to do it for many years and it worked great for me and I still do it. I bought 12 inch gel sheets from Amazon. And by the way, gang, um, we're talking about color gels, right? So we're not talking about CTOs, meaning you don't have to buy expensive stuff. So please remember that, right? You, it, it, there's, there's, you don't have to be worried about optical quality of gels and is and is it the the proper color blue or pink for me the brighter bolder richer that color is the better and if i can get it cheap that's awesome so literally i have tons and tons and tons of these 12 inch gel sheets that i buy on amazon in packs right find the boldest colors that i can and spend less than 20 dollars on a pack of gels also on Amazon, I would go ahead or, and by the way, you could go to like a Staples or even like a Joann's Fabrics, those kind of places. I would buy little Velcro squares, Velcro tabs. And on the gels, I would put four tabs on each gel. So in the middle of each, these were 12 inch gel sheets, right? So in the middle of each side, right on the edge, I would put a Velcro tab. On all of my seven inch reflectors, that I have in my studio. I have two Velcro tabs mounted opposite each other on either side of the reflector. So if I was putting that gel overneath a light that had the seven inch reflector, it's literally grab the gel, slap it on both sides, boom, it's done. No cut, paste, no nothing. When I'm done with it, just grab it, yank. It's yanking off a piece of Velcro. And wait till I tell you how I store them. That makes this whole thing even better. On the soft boxes that I used on a regular basis, I would take off the diffusers and I would go ahead and I would put four tabs of Velcro inside the soft boxes. So specifically with the soft boxes, I would make sure that when I was buying my Velcro tabs, I was buying white because I always use white interiors. And even if you're using silver, still stick with white. Don't do black. That's fine. But I would put the four tabs in. So if I wanted to gel the light that was in a soft box, which by the way, just for what it's worth, Charles, most, at least in my experience, now I'm not saying what you're doing is wrong and I'm not saying that you should change the way you're doing it, but I will tell you this. The majority of the time when I'm using gels, the light that I'm putting the gel on, I have no real need for a soft box or a beauty dish on that light. So just maybe to give some thought to wherever you're placing your gels, unless of course your gel is your key light, that's a whole other story. But, but if your gel's not your key light, you have to question, do you actually need the modifier? I'm not saying it's wrong, but do you need it? So, um, but I'd have the four tabs in the soft box and then, you know, on the fly when I'm working, I'd mount the soft box, peel up in one of the little flaps, you know, basically just curl that 12 inch gel into my hand, slide it through the flap and then slap down the four tabs in the Velcro and boom, it's good to go. Okay. Cause you don't have to seal the edges to it. You just got to make sure it's covering the bulk of the light source and it, and it works great. Uh, I have done the same with beauty dishes. Now it, with the beauty dishes, I did not want to mount Velcro strips in the beauty dish because the beauty dishes are a little bit smaller and they really depend on that light curving out the sides. So in the case of the beauty dishes, Charles, I did use tape. I, I would just, you know, four small pieces of tape and I would, would tape the gel in right over top of the deflector plate because that's going to be the narrowest part. And a 12-inch gel almost always covers that space. 
you know, and, and then you're good to go. But here's the other bonus to the Velcro. While you're buying your Velcro stuff, buy a roll of Velcro strips. So in my studio downstairs, when I first set it up, I had gone to a kitchen cabinet place to buy the cabinetry for my makeup area. And they had a clearance section. And I found this actually really nice uh, high-end cabinet with these drawers and an open compartment that I got for like 40 bucks because the bottom kick plate was damaged. So that's like a little workspace for me. On either side of it, I have two rows of Velcro stripping, self-adhesive that are taped to the side of this cabinet. All of my 12-inch gel squares just hang down these. So when I need one, I just walk over. I want green, grab the green. I go use it. When I come back, I go over, stick it right back on the, on the strip. And of course, you can overlap them as they go down. So I probably have 40 or 50 gels hanging between these four strips that are sitting on the side of what is essentially a kitchen cabinet, right? So I, that's what I would recommend because otherwise the, the challenge that you're going to have, you are going to put yourself in a, in a box, Charles. And, and that's the thing that bothers me from my experience that bothers me more about what you're trying to accomplish. I personally am an efficiency nut. If I could set something up, do it once, and then from that point forward, make it easy so I don't have to like just do it all over again, I am all in on that. But here's where you have to be really careful when you do stuff like that, especially as a photographer, and especially if you care about creativity. If you allow yourself to get too automated and too systematized, because I talk about kind of building a workflow and a system a lot, and that's important. But if you get too into a groove, you're putting all your creativity in a box and you're only going to create within that box and all of your images are going to start to look the same. People get will get bored with your images and you will get bored taking them. So there's kind of this unfortunate reality, and it is unfortunate because who, who enjoys setting up and tearing down? Certainly not me, right? But there's this unfortunate reality that you want to keep things a little bit loose in terms of how you do stuff like that so that you're always looking to solve problems, so that you're always going through steps that are going to trigger possible solutions and give you new ideas. So I just give you that warning, find the balance, right? I completely understand the mindset because I'm wired exactly the same way of, you know, let me find this one thing that I'm going to drop it in, takes two seconds and boom, I'm good to go, right? Done. But at the same time, what's going to happen, I know from experience, is you're going to wind up in a situation where you're limiting the types of modifiers that you can use or the way that you can use them. And the minute we put the word limiting into the conversation, that means we're also limiting our creative options. So that's the reason why I caution you about trying to find kind of the one size fits all solution. And it is worth saying, you know, I, I went with the gel scenario and I went inside the modifiers. I mean, depending on how often you're going to use these colors, Charles, you could go to a dollar store and buy some rolls of colored cellophane. Now, I can't speak for every dollar store in the world, right? But most dollar stores that I've been in and found colored cellophane the cellophane is not particularly saturated because it's really thin, right? So even though it might be like a bright yellow or a bright blue, it is so thin in density, really all it's going to do is give you like a pale color. So you can still use that stuff. And I encourage you, if, you're, if you've got a couple one-off projects, don't go buy a whole set of gels. Go get some cellophane because you can reuse the cellophane for other things later, right? But um, you're going to want to overlap several layers of the cellophane to really make the color rich. I just point that out in the sense that let's say it's an occasional thing or it's a color that you occasionally use. You get those rolls of cellophane. And if you have a 24 inch by 36 inch softbox, you can, it's easy to find 24 inch rolls of cellophane. You cut three and uh, three foot piece of it. And you may need two or three of those three feet piece. So it may take you two or three rolls, which means you're up to three bucks which is still less than you're going to pay for a pack of filters. But indeed, those filters are more durable. They'll last longer. They're easier to manage. The cellophane is thin. And, you know, you may be able to use it a couple times, but you can't fold it up. You could roll it up. 
And after a while, it's going to get all crinkled and just be a mess. And, you know, so it all depends on ultimately what your needs are. Right. Okay. So Charles, I hope that helps. Um, you guys got no questions. You guys like got your, your photography nailed down. Everything's going great. I see one other question here. I'm going to dive into this. Um, but here's your chance. What kind of stuff are you struggling with? Okay. Uh, Danny in Las Vegas. It, and by the way, WPPI, Danny, I'm going to be there. I hope to see you. Um, March 1st, 2nd, 3rd, I'm going to be doing a seminar at WPPI that is all about LED lighting. And we'll be shooting some really cool fashion portraits, of course. Uh, I'm going to be doing a photo walk, which will be outdoors, shooting beauty, the kinds of beauty portraits that I do. But we're going to do them outside. We're going to do them outside in natural light with maybe a little bit of LED lighting mixed in. And I will be at the Stella Pro booth doing a whole bunch of demos and stuff like that. So if you're going to WPPI, make sure you're going to be there. And uh, Imaging USA, folks, uh, like it's a month away. In fact, it's a, it's less than a month away. Um, January 13th, I will be doing... So any of you that live on the East Coast, if you're not going to WPPI, or excuse me, if you're not going to Imaging USA, I don't know why. Uh, it is in National Harbor, Maryland. The... Um, conference and expo are from january 16th to the 18th so that's a sunday monday tuesday and thursday friday saturday so that's 13 14 15 there are pre-con classes some of which like mine are all day so on thursday the 13th i'm doing one of the first ones from 9 a.m to 5 p.m it's your chance to spend a full day with me all day long and i'm going to go through my entire portrait and fashion portrait process start to finish Con you know, conceiving the ideas, getting the pieces together, styling things. The makeup artist is going to be doing the hair and makeup in the room. So we'll be involving all of that in the conversation as far as what we do, how we do it. We're going to shoot some cool stuff. We're going to go through some lighting options. We'll talk a little bit about post-processing. We're also going to talk a little bit about how you make some money. And as long as everything goes well, a few of the attendees will have the opportunity to actually participate and shoot their own images, not shoot what I shot but shoot their own images of the model that we will have for the event. So, so that's coming up. So Danny's question, and Charles, I see you've got a follow-up here. I'll come back to it, okay? Danny's question was, is matching the white balance to a color gel um, better in camera or in post? So Danny, it really depends on why you're using the color gel, what color the gel is, uh, what your intent is. So, um, and I'm, I'm being very generalized. But I think it's this is an easy way to kind of have a conversation. We can split color gels at a very general level. We'll say 50,000 feet level. We can split them into two categories, right? We can split them into the CTOs, which are basically the color correction gels, right? Uh, those are going to be like the oranges, the yellows, and the blues, where you are trying to like balance daylight with tungsten or tungsten with daylight and, and vice versa or fluorescent lighting, okay? Um, those are your color correction gels. And then you have uh, your very, very rich color gels, like the kind that you see me all, use all the time where you've got like the rich blues or, uh, you know, any of that kind of stuff. So if we're talking about the color correction stuff, you want to try and do as much in camera as you can because that's why you're using the color correction gel. That's really kind of the whole point behind the color correction gel is to get it right in camera. And certainly back in the film days, that's what we did. If you're talking about the rich color stuff, I would still say the same thing. Try to get it as close as possible in the camera. As you're doing your test shots, if you have a situation, let's say you've got a blue gel on your light and, it, and it's on a rim light or a fill light, whatever. But if you've got a blue gel on your light and your subject's entire face has a blue tint to it, but that's not what you want. You, you want the face. And I, I'm just saying, you can want whatever you want. But if the idea is you want the face to be proper color balance, but then you want to have kind of the blue like filtering in on the sides of the face, all that kind of stuff, then really what that is, is not an indicator that you need to fix it in post. That's an indicator that you're doing something wrong with your lighting setup. In other words, the lighting setup that you've put together, it's not lighting your subject the way that you want it to. So really what you should be doing at that point is you should be reevaluating because here's what's going to happen. 
So let's say you've got that little bit of a blue tint. You know, it's, it's kind of just making the whole thing look very cold color. So let's say you go ahead and shoot it and say, okay, well, I'll, I'll bring that skin tone back in post. Well, what's going to happen in post to get that blue tint out, you're going to have to remove blue from the image. Well, then all that blue that you're trying to add in, you're reducing it. So then you get into a situation where then you've got to mask out the skin tone and you've got to deal them both separately. And so you're actually creating a lot of extra work for yourself. Are there times, are there reasons why that would be the way you want to do it? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, again, remember folks, at the end of the day, there's no rule here. It's all about the end result, but there is the practicality of how do you achieve the best quality? How do you do it in the least amount of time? Because even if you're doing it for fun, time has value, right? Time in your life has value. Every minute that goes by, you don't get it back. So you really do want to, you know, prioritize where, where are you making your choices? Um, so ultimately, uh, Danny, I would, whenever possible, try to get it right in camera. Uh, and if you're going to, if you're going to be at, uh, my seminars and if you're going to stop by the, the Stella Pro booth in w, at WPPI when I'm in Vegas, you'll see me doing stuff with gels and, and we will be, you know, kind of balancing everything out and, and working it all out. So um, you'll get to see a little bit of that stuff firsthand also. Okay. Um, and let's see here, Charles, I saw you had a follow-up. You've got the 42 trying soon. Okay. Yeah. Um, is Godox the only, uh, show in town for bare bulb strobes? No, not at all. There's a bunch of companies that make bare bulb strobes. I mean, you've got the Godox stuff. Um, I believe Westcott has some bare bulbs. Uh, Profoto has bare bulbs. There's still some of the old school brands like uh, Photogenic. You can still find them around. Um, yeah, there's a bunch of brown color. Uh, all expensive stuff. Um, you know, I'm curious why you're like so intent on the bare bulb. I, just to be clear, I like bare bulbs when I'm shooting with strobes. Um, but I wouldn't spend a ton of extra money unless you're legit getting real value out of that, especially because all those heavy duty strobes, they just don't make sense anymore. They, they, they really don't. LEDs where it's at, gang. You know, and, and look, I'm not saying rush out and dump all your strobes today and buy LEDs. So let's be really clear. That's not what I'm saying. But LED is where it's at. Uh, it, folks, if you're not paying attention to LEDs, if you're not paying attention to uh, all of this new lighting is coming out, like uh, uh, the Stella Pro from Light and Motion, the, the Reflex S and the Reflex. If you're not paying attention to those lights and, and what those lights are capable of doing and the feature sets that they're bringing to constant lighting, you're really putting yourself behind the eight ball because it's not going to be that far down the road that I'm telling you, it's, everything is going to flip on end. Everything. The cameras, lighting, everything. And that's not to scare you. That's cool stuff. It really is. Okay. All right. So let's see here. Um, Charles, I've also seen large gel seats, 20 by 48, which cover the front most modifiers. Yeah. And, and you're going to spend a ton of money if you buy actual gel sheets there, Charles. So again, I, I'm sorry, man, but I, I would have to know, you know, I would have to know a little bit more about what you're doing in more detail. Not here. I got to, I got to answer some other people's questions, but I, I, I'm not going to lie. Just in my experience in answering questions for photographers, I think you're a little bit tunnel vision on what you're trying to do and how you're trying to do it. Open your mind up a little bit. Um, because even like having to gel the modifiers, I'm telling you, like, I just don't see a good reason for gelling modifiers as much as you seem to need to gel modifiers. Doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Doesn't mean you can't do it. Just means like, you know, if you want to have blue light coming across a person's face here, right? And a little bit on their shoulders and that kind of stuff. You can put a soft box on that light, but then I'll take a strobe, a speed light, and I'll create the exact same light with just a gel in front of it. I don't need the darn modifier to do the exact same thing, the exact same thing. So my point is, you save yourself a ton of money if you really master the inverse square law. Hate to say it, folks. I know we didn't get through a whole episode without me throwing those three words into the mix, but okay. All right. So let's see here. Um, Miguel, event photography and fluorescent light. Yes. Every photographer's worst nightmare. Well, at least it used to be. Not so much now. Cameras are so much better with white balance. But uh, should I eliminate all light and use the flash or use gels? 
to contrast the green hue? Well, you know what, um, Miguel, it depends. So here's the thing, and, and here's why I say it depends, right? When I read the words event photography and fluorescent light, honestly, that takes me back, you know, 30 years when I was shooting film. And yes, it, it, it kind of makes me cringe because fluorescent light and film were just like two horrible things. Okay. Um, the, the, the challenge is most event venues today. And I know for a fact that even in Puerto Rico, well, maybe not most event venues, but a lot of event venues. Cause I'm a, I'm a big fan of uh, Noel de Pilar at, who shoots weddings in Puerto Rico and his work. So I, I see this in some of the work he does. A lot of event venues today, especially if it's a wedding or even a big corporate event, you walk in and they have lit the room, the walls especially, with really saturated color LEDs to make the room really cool and moody. In other words, they basically create an atmosphere with lighting. So the problem you run into is the minute you use a flash, right, that flash is going to wipe out those LEDs simply because the flash is so much brighter. And then you're stuck with a situation of, well, the bride or the company, they paid a lot of money for that cool lighting. They want to see that lighting in the pictures. So if you're relying on flash, the problem you have then is you've got to go ahead and start working at a much slower shutter speed to be able to gather more light so that you're recording that LED lighting in its, in its richness and its saturation, but not blowing it out with the flash that you're going to wind up turning all the way down to its lowest power to photograph the people in front of you. So uh, the first thing I've got to say to all that is I, you're, what you're describing is the perfect reason to go with LEDs. It's, it's the perfect reason to go with LEDs. Now, if indeed you've got a specific case scenario where this venue does not have a lot of color to it and it is just straight up ugly old fluorescent lighting, there's two ways that you can look at it. Version number one is you use your flash for the foreground. You still work at a fairly slow shutter speed and you allow the background to pick up a little bit of that pistachio colored tint that you'll get from fluorescent lighting. Not a lot of people like that color. So I'm not saying that's the best one or indeed, as you know, you're suggesting you're going to use multiple flashes and you're going to use gels and you're basically going to have to go into that event space, whatever the venue is, and you're going to have to create your own lighting. So if it's a stage, you know, maybe you're going to wind up having one or two lights aimed at the stage and the subject and another maybe one or two lights that are sitting on the stage aimed up with some colored gels to, to add some interest in the background, that type of thing. But yes, you, you become the person kind of responsible for all of it. I'm a big fan of trying in, in event situations. I'm a big fan of trying to make my lighting as unobtrusive as possible, but still got to be interesting, meaning... If it's got to be obtrusive, it's going to be obtrusive. It, it's going to be there. It's going to be bold. And, and you know, it, it's all about what the client wants and what the client's expectations are. So uh, at the end of the day, if the client wants something really cool and big and they don't have that in the venue, then they're going to be much more tolerant of you having to set up flashes that are going to be popping off all the time. But especially for events, you know, you, you go into those rooms with all that bright color and you can use um, low powered LEDs and balance everything out. And notice I said low powered LEDs because that way they're not like, oh gosh, there's a camera crew from a television station here because the lights are so bright and they're blinding everybody. No, you can dial the lights down enough that you're really just using the lights to make sure that you're getting good lighting on your foreground subjects and then whatever else is in the room, you're recording it accordingly, okay? So I hope that helps. Uh, let's see here. I just saw... Um, Brian, are all LED lights continuous or can LED be strobe as well? So no, but listen closely. I had to answer the question the way you asked it first. Okay. LEDs and strobes are two completely different things. It's two different types of physics, two different types of bulbs, etc. However, I just a moment ago mentioned the reflex lights from uh, Stella Pro. The reflex, and I don't have one sitting here, but you know what? I can bring it up on a page and, and I will show you. Um, what you have to do, Brian, is you have to stop using the word strobe and you use the word digital burst, okay? And digital burst gives you a strobe-like effect. So let's see, browser here. 
Uh, this is the light I'm talking about right here, reflex, okay? As soon as the page loads. Um, so this is the reflex, and this is just one version of the reflex because what you're actually looking at in that picture is you're looking at three pieces to the light, right? You are looking at a modifier. That's, whoops, that's the spot optic that's on the front. You are looking at the light itself, which by the way, Ryan, that light fits in the palm of your hand. That's how tiny it is, okay? And then you're looking at the handle, um, which is a battery grip. So these lights, just to give you a sense of what they do, here, I can play a video for you. Um, and full disclosure, also, Brian, I'm not trying to sell you these. I, I am an ambassador for this company, which is why I'm talking about this one. But um, here's an idea of what that light can do. I'll let you guys watch this really quick. So Brian, that's a constant LED. And basically what they're able to do with some really, really cool chip technology is they're able to essentially overpower the LED, like overcharge it, so that it actually picks up a whole extra stop of light when it bursts. Now they have two versions of it, the Reflex, which will do uh, five frames per second, and the Reflex S, which is the one that I had on the screen and that you saw me using in that video, that one will do up to 20 frames um, per second, okay? So um, yes, it is a whole new world when it comes to lighting and LED. But one more thing, Brian, before I just make that sound all amazing, because I wanna make sure, you, and, and don't run out and buy this. I'm an ambassador for them. Don't run out and buy that light, Brian, because there's more things you need to understand. And it's important that you understand it before you make any, any lighting purchase. But this is what I'm trying to make you all understand. You've got to pay attention to this stuff because it's coming and it's coming fast and furious and it needs to get here. It's amazing. Brian, when we're talking about flash and digital burst, it's not as powerful as your strobes. But that's not bad, right? It's, it's simply not bad. So literally these lights are actually, they compare somewhere in the neighborhood of, of a lower powered speed light in that neighborhood. But the point is, that's a dumb comparison. Truly dumb comparison. Here's why. You can't measure constant light the same way you measure flash. And especially with the way these digital bursts are designed to work, there's a, a basically a cumulative lighting effect based on your shutter speed. So here's what's cool about this, right? Um, no sync speeds. So like you can shoot at a 500th of a second, at a thousandth of a second, and that light's still gonna sink. But here's what you're gonna have to do, Brian. And depending on how much time you spend on YouTube, this may send chills down your spine, but you're gonna have to raise your ISO a little bit because you don't have the same kind of power. The thing that we're missing out on the industry gang, and, and look, this is simple math. Don't take my word for it. If you've paid attention, it's happened right in front of your eyes. As an industry, we are not using our cameras the way they were designed to be made. Now, before you get PO'd at me, I said we, but we're not. We're not using our cameras the way they're designed to be made. Mirrorless cameras are designed for whizzy wig usage. What you see is what you get. That's the beauty of a, a mirrorless camera. So why then would we not use whizzy wig lighting? Why are we still using antiquated strobes? Think about it. You know why? I can tell you the why. Because it's what we're used to. It's because that's what we know. And look, I'm not making fun of anybody. I, I was the same way, right? But the thing of it is, is all your cameras today, even my micro four thirds cameras, I can go ahead and I can up my ISO to 640 instead of 200 and use one of these lights just like I would my Godox 8200. And guess what? My finished image quality is just as good as anything else. In fact, here, um, this picture, whoops, now it, I'm not gonna be able to get it to load right away. Oh, I can get it in the portfolio. Um, this shot right here, Brian, was done at a higher ISO with an Olympus camera and the reflex lights. This is the shot that you saw me making 
in that promotional video for the lights. You're not seeing any noise. And and I get it. You're watching on YouTube right now. Go to my website afterwards. That, that image is going to expand to your full browser. So you make your browser as big as you can and look at that image. You're not going to pick up noise. What you are going to be able to do is count every single eyelash that model has, right? So that's the key, okay? All right. Uh, gosh, I'm over time here, but let's let's get a couple of these questions. That's what I want to do. So photo mix. Putting aside the LED strobe speed light, isn't that the same concept uh, that all of them have nowadays? Uh, no, not even close, photo mix media. Not even close. Right, if you're talking about Rotolite and that kind of stuff, yeah, Rotolite's got a similar concept, but they did it wrong. I mean, I honestly feel that they did it wrong, right? Here's why. As photographers, so I'm going to lump you all in with me. So if you don't belong in this group uh, about this thought process, by all means, ignore what I say. But as photographers, we are used to using a light source that has a single light bulb, whether it be a speed light, whether it be a bare bulb flash, whatever it is, it's got a single light source, right? And then what do we do? We put these big modifiers on them. Why do we do that? Because we want soft lighting, right? We've been talking about that already. So now, Rotolite comes along with what seems like this revolutionary light. The, the Neo has been out. I think it's the Neo. Is that what it's called? That's been out for a while, right? But it's like this big around. It's tiny, number one. The modifiers are not the same modifiers that you're already using. So if you decide to switch to one of these, you have to do one of two things. You either have to buy completely different modifiers, and guess what? You can't put beauty dishes on them. You can't put a lot of the same kind of modifiers that you're already using on them. So you either have to buy different modifiers, but then what you do have to do, like it or not, is you have to change the way that you think about your light placement. So if you're not really up on the inverse square law, but you're doing okay with your soft boxes, you better go learn the inverse square law before you try and use one of those lights. With a light like the Reflex, I use my same Bowens modifiers. That's the beauty of it. They have a Pro Photo mount, they have a Shamira mount, and they have um, a Bowens mount. So I use the exact same modifiers that I've been using, and it's a single point light source. With a Roto light, if I don't modify the Roto light, yeah, I know they sell a diffuser, but still, what do you have? You have multiple points of light. Which actually, if you've ever had a chance to shoot with like, you know, you know how you can buy those, those cheap 12 inch LED light panels. A lot of photographers, I suckered into those when they first came out. Cause like, Ooh, that's really cool. They're the harshest light you've ever used because it's all simple, direct points of light. Right? So even when you diffuse them, it's still not as soft and as even as you're used to getting out of your soft boxes. So, so that's the thing. Are there going to be more companies that come up with this kind of stuff? Eventually, sure. I, gu I guarantee you there will be, simply because it makes sense. It's the first time in 20 years digital cameras have been mass marketed for just over 20 years now. It's the first time in 20 years we've been able to light with our digital cameras the way they've been intended to, to, to be used. And I, actually, it's not 20 years. I misspoke since the first mirrorless cameras came out. So that's probably about 15 years, right? So it's the first time in 15 years that we've been able to light the way our cameras were intended to be used. Constant lighting simply makes sense. The purpose for the burst is to get a little bit more power and indeed to be able to stop action, help you stop action if necessary. The thought process that you're changing is with a flash, you're automatically going to set your shutter speed to the fastest shutter speed that you have that syncs with flash. So it's going to be like 160, 200, or 250. That entire thought process goes out the window when you work with constant lighting. And when you work with a digital burst, now you're thinking, crap, I got to learn something new. No, you don't. You just have to unlearn sync speed. Unlearn sync speed. All you're going to do is say, oh, that subject's moving. How fast is it moving? I need at least a 250th of a second to stop that. Set it at 250. Oh, it's moving really fast. I need a 500th of a second. Set it at 500th. In other words, it's the same thought process that you use if you're taking pictures outside in natural lighting. So it's actually easy. It's easier all the way around. Even with a mirrorless camera, you use a flash. Even if you have a modeling light, you take a picture and what do you immediately do? Chimp. How does it look? Right? When you're shooting natural light with your mirrorless cameras, you're seeing the finished image, the finished exposure, the finished depth of field, everything. 
as you press the button. So the only time you need to chimp in natural light with a mirrorless camera is if you're shooting some big piece of action, you wanna make sure you caught the right moment. But you see your exposure when you shoot it. So yes, for those of you that take a lot of underexposed and overexposed images with your mirrorless cameras, why is that? Because you don't have an excuse. That's, you're just not paying attention. I'm sorry, but that's why that happens. So the great part about working with WYSIWYG lighting is just that. You're seeing the finished exposure as you're shooting. That's, that's the beauty of it. So, um, all right, there was one other question I wanted to get back here. And then, and then we got to wrap this up, guys. Uh, from Cass. Cass, sorry, I saw it. I didn't, I didn't ignore you. Uh, I've been dipping into dance photography and I'm struggling achieving high key blown out white backgrounds without shadows. I'm using two strobe, two strobe, yes, two studio strobes with soft boxes, two flashes. Um, so, Cass, if that's two lights total, that's why you're not getting the blown out background. If you're using two soft boxes as your front lights and two lights behind your dancers on the background. So in other words, if you have a total of four lights, then you just have to turn up the power on the background lights, right? You're going to want it to be a stop and a half to two stops brighter than the exposure of your subject. So if your subject is metering at F5.6, you want that background to meter between um, 8 and 11. That's that's how you want that to come in. Yeah, so if you've got forecasts, that's all it is. Dial up uh, the background lights. Now, you may be making the mistake that a lot of people are doing since you wrote this, the way you, you said it, well, actually, you, you said studio strobes and then you said flashes. So I'm going to make an assumption, correct me really quick, that you've got actual studio strobes for the front and then you're using speed lights on the background. If that's the case, if you've got two studio strobes and two speed lights, switch them. Yep. No, you just answered your own question. There it is, Cass. Yes. Put the strobes on the background. Put the speed lights in the foreground. Problem solved. Right? That's that. That's literally all it is. You want to meter your background a stop and a half to two stops brighter, and you're going to have a pure white background. And also, too, don't, you know, because you're going to do that, try not to have your, your dancer too close to the background. If at all possible, a minimum of five feet different distance seven to eight feet would be much better because then what you're actually doing, Cass, is you're creating two different lighting zones. What's going to happen then is basically none of the light from your speed lights is going to reach the background. That's okay. The two studio strobes are going to light the background and you're going to angle them as such that none of that light is pushing past your subject. <laughs> yes, it is the inverse square law. You got it. All right, gang. Um, whew, some good stuff. I, and I know you guys get me going on this lighting stuff. I, I know it's like, it gives people headaches. The lighting thing, especially with LED lights and mirrorless cameras, it's a new conversation and not everybody's talking about it yet. And look, I mean, you know, companies like Profoto, companies like Westcott, I'm not making them out to be bad, but they don't want to talk about that, right? They got a lot of money going on in strobes there and strobes aren't going to completely go away. It's just the fact that the majority of photographers taking pictures today, majority, and I'm talking taking pictures, shooting portraits, people, events, don't actually need strobes. That's a fact. I'll debate that fact until all the air is gone. That's a fact, right? So again, it's not that you got to rush out and buy stuff now, but again, pay attention, right? You know, if you're going to have any duration of a career with photography, and when I say career, I just mean it could be for fun, right? But if you're going to stick with photography, you know, I'm not a gearhead. I don't get stuck in the weeds with, you know, the coolest, latest, newest toy. But I do pay attention to what's out and what's coming that is going to make my life and my job easier and allow me more freedom and more potential to improve my photography. Because no piece of gear is going to improve your photography, but it can provide you the potential to improve. And that's where we're at with this lighting conversation. So believe me, you're going to see a lot of back and forth about this LED lighting stuff for a while, but I'm pointing out to you, it's because strobes are comfortable. We're used to strobes. We know strobes, but that doesn't make them the best. It definitely doesn't make them the easiest because they're not, right? So food for thought, gang. All right, listen, um, 
Have a great week. I am going to take next week off. It's close to the holiday. So for those of you that do celebrate Christmas and Kwanzaa and all those, have a wonderful holiday. And for those of you that don't, everything slows down. You probably get some time off work. So have a great holiday. Pick up your dog on cameras. And hey, listen, you know, if you're paying attention to the news, a lot of us are going back into lockdowns and all that kind of stuff. No politics, but I'm just saying, shoot, because you don't know how much longer you're going to be able to get together and shoot with people before we have to take a break again with the way things are going, right? So find excuses, take pictures. I will catch up with you guys after the holiday. As always, thank you for your support. Stay safe and stay healthy. Adios. Take care.